All right, welcome everyone to this afternoon's uh, webinar series. This is the third part of our decoding uh, community economics, community wealth uh, in Oklahoma City. And we are so grateful that you are joining us. I'm joined by some powerhouse individuals uh, that are homegrown uh, and are gonna share with us uh, some insights into Northeast Oklahoma City's Renaissance, uh, how public and private partnerships can come together, entrepreneurship, um, and again, community wealth building. So with that, I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves. Uh, let's first start with Quentin Hughes, Dr. Quentin Hughes. Thanks for that, uh, Mariana, and uh, thanks so much for inviting me here today. Uh, as she said, my name is Quentin Hughes. Um, I lead Northeast OKC Renaissance Inc. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization uh, with the mission of being a catalyst for ethical place-based community development in Northeast Oklahoma City. Um, I'm also a business owner um, and I've been an educator in uh, Northeast Oklahoma City for uh, about a decade. Awesome, thank you for joining us, Dr. Hughes. How about Jonathan Dotson? Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan Dotson, uh, CEO at uh, Pivot Project and uh, been a co-developer with Mr. Thompson and a co-owner with uh, Dr. Hughes. Uh, hopefully we don't have to call him Dr. Hughes the whole meeting, we can call him Hughes. Please don't. So, uh, but uh, yeah, our company is basically, we focus on uh, trying to create relevant development uh, in the urban core of Oklahoma City. Um, we try to create uh, structures where not only the developer or the equity um, experience uh, success or create wealth, uh, but also where we can partner with our tenants to do so as well. We think that's one of the best ways to try to prevent uh, negative gentrification, uh, especially to communities of color. So glad to be here and uh, excited to be a part of uh, what we're getting ready to talk about. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Jonathan. And I'll throw it over to Mr. Thompson, Sandino Thompson. All right, um, my name is Sandino Thompson. I'm a community developer, um, work with uh, Pivot Project and their CEO, Jonathan Dodson on the East Point uh, development, as well as worked with Dr. Hughes on uh, the uh, Northeast Renaissance uh, um, organization, uh, or community organizing and placemaking efforts. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just uh, interested in uh, creating a sort of positive change in momentum um, via, uh, via uh, economic development, via community development, uh, revitalization efforts, and uh, pretty much putting uh, leveraging whatever skill sets or resources that I have into those uh, efforts for the sake of uh, Northeast Oklahoma City community, but also I think in a, in a little broader context, other, other similar communities with similar types of issues, um, I um, have had interest in, uh, in engaging and supporting as well. Wonderful, great to have all three of you here. We may be joined shortly by an additional panelist. You know, previously we discussed entrepreneurship and capital strategies and here today kind of how those things come together along with real estate redevelopment. And so I just, you all are part of the East uh, Point uh, development. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that came to fruition, what the vision was and where you all are today? And I'll start with Sam Dino. Um, sure. So for me, uh, the, the East Point uh, development is, uh, I mean, is at least probably 10 years in the making, um, and it kind of connects to at least the, the, the other, my other two panelists, because um, I think I've been engaged with uh, Quentin for at least that long, and then uh, for Jonathan, not long after. And um, that was really, I mean, my interest in, um, I had left Oklahoma City for a while, I was born and raised, uh, grew up here, uh, graduated from uh, Oklahoma State University, um, and then like a lot of folks uh, who grew up in the 80s and 90s in Oklahoma City, uh, figured that uh, some of the best opportunities for me might be elsewhere. Um, and, um, and after about 10 years uh, doing uh, managing construction projects and those kind of things in different parts of uh, the Southeast United States, um, Oklahoma is home. And so I always kind of paid attention to what was happening. And obviously in the 2000s, the 2010s, um, we saw a lot of development um, and a lot of promise uh, that Oklahoma City had gained. And one of the things I noticed though, uh, being from here and being connected and staying connected to the place was that 
Um, the northeast side, uh, the sides of towns, the parts of towns that I grew up in, the parts of towns where my family was and where I spent time when I was here, uh, were not sort of equally engaged in the story of the Oklahoma City Renaissance. So I saw a lot of great things happening in the 10 years or so uh, from the time I left uh, Oklahoma to when I uh, decided to move back. One of the catalysts for me moving back was feeling like uh, we really had an opportunity uh, to engage and, and create uh, some better connection for the story of Oklahoma City to really inclusively be uh, make sure that the Northeast side was a part of that story. And so um, 10 years ago, I moved back and immediately sort of organized both my experience um, in building communities and places and, and spaces um, with relationships that I had had here focused on community revitalization efforts. We started kind of grassroots in organizing. Um, and a lot of those efforts over the three, four, five years uh, kind of culminated in East Point being really a project that uh, was designed to kind of check as many of the boxes for the things that we heard people in the community uh, uh, have interest in, the kinds of immunity, amenities and the kind of deficits that we saw that were existing in the community, um, and really just tried to figure out how we could sort of uh, solve as many of those, uh, those challenges as possible with East Point, and that was kind of uh, how the development came to be, at least my involvement in it, and, and how it kind of got oriented with the work that was focused on on the Northeast side. And, and Jonathan, your involvement being the developer, you've done a ton of projects in Oklahoma City. What, what kind of drew you to this specific project in Northeast Oklahoma City? And what are some of the issues or barriers that you uh, ran up against with trying to pull this off with the community? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, Sandino briefly alluded to it, but most of this started out of friendship. And so, uh, we were friends and started trying to do some things as we were, you know, learning they're going to do another maps. We really wanted to be maps for neighborhoods. And so we started getting engaged in different communities, not just the East side and asking those communities what they wanted to see and what stood out to us um, over on the East side was a desire to have access to healthcare, access to food and representative retail. And those are things that are obviously in abundance over on the West side of town, but not on the East side of town. And so, um, you know, as we started talking about it, I think there was a desire to do something um, that upended the traditional models of um, how how traditional white developers go into communities of color. And, you know, usually there's an idea that if you have access to power or access to money, you're a blessing to a community. And what we felt like was uh, if we could prostitute kind of the, the access we had to those two things, power and money, um, in an effort to hang out and be a part of that community, we would do so and uh, we would kind of be the ones who won. And so uh, we would benefit from that. Um, and so in talking with Sandina, we started saying, well, what are the other things can we do to flip the model? And one was to you know, bring him in as a partner. And so he was willing to take a risk and, and co-develop that with us, um, trusting us to actually do what we said we would do uh, because he had spent, you know, 10 years previous, actually building a reputation as someone who followed through with what he said. And then um, on top of that, we said that we wanted to uh, give the tenants um, ownership in the real estate so that we didn't create something like has happened in the plaza where the tenants create the success and then the landlord gets to kick them out and replace them with higher paying tenants. And, um, you know, they get moved somewhere else. And so when you have displacement, especially in communities of color, it is, it is incredibly destructive because um, that community is where they've had to go to find most of the safety nets that the government has provided historically for uh, the white community. And so if you get displaced out of that and you get moved to the suburbs, you're, you're far away from your safety net. And so it really became important to us that we did it the right way. And um, our hope was that if we if we did those things, then we could we could find a way to make it financially um, sustainable. And so I guess the final piece of that that we did that was different was we paid the community to tenant the building. And so anyone who brought us a tenant that ended up signing a lease, we ended up paying them for that, realizing that the community itself um, does a much better job of knowing who the entrepreneurs are that should be in this space and how they fit together than me or some other broker that we would hire who would just try to replicate something that's worked on the west side of town. 
Um, so that's kind of how we got involved. Uh, you know, the, the barriers that we faced are um, uh, somewhat couched in the fact that we're still, you know, we're, we're about as uh, white hipster dudes as you can get. We office above a craft beer bar. And, uh, you know, I, when, I, when I go over to the east side, I ride my bike. And so uh, I fit a lot of things that, um, that should, get, should have made it easier for me to get capital, to be frankly. Like we've done a lot of projects in Oklahoma City and we had a great tenant lined up, a hundred year old healthcare tenant who um, had signed a 10 year lease. And so I was pretty confident we could get financing. And, you know, we've told the story before, but 25 banks or more wouldn't even give us terms because of the side of town we were on. And some of them just said, we don't lend money to that side of town. And so for us, what became incredibly evident is um, a lot of times there's criticism that I have heard about, you know, the reason why uh, you know, the east side of town looks like it does is people just don't invest in their own community. And what most of those folks don't realize is that we've set up a system that's impossible for them to invest in their own community. There is no uh, way to get, um, so if like Pivot Project, who all we do is development, we couldn't get a really good loan for a project that had no risk, then how do you expect some 25-year-old entrepreneur to um, actually get enough money to um, you know, start a business or do something on that side of town. And on top of that, once we did get the bank debt, you know, we have 11 retail spaces that we had to lease and we had over 40 LOIs signed, um, which means that 40 people signed letters of intent to move into the space. And a lot of them were just short 25, $35,000. And so they were like, well, I got a concept already that works. This will be my second one. Surely I can go get financing for that. And they couldn't get financing for their own spot. And so we became, you know, we basically had to tend at the building almost four times uh, just to get enough people in there to take all the space. And so those are, you know, significant challenges that you wouldn't ever have that issue anywhere else, you know, kind of on the Northwest sector. Um, and it's just the, the, uh, the reality of what happens when you don't lend money and you withdraw capital and you have redlining and you do this for multiple generations. So. Well, and I appreciate the, the history that you had shared there with, with redlining and the impact that uh, even developers like yourself still encounter with trying to revitalize or be a part of community-based development. You talked about entrepreneurship and leadership and, um, you know, kind of activating the space. And one place that I frequent very often is Kindred Spirits. Uh, which is co-owned by some of the dopest people in town. Uh, so Quentin, I want to talk to you. You're a visionary, you're a leader in the community. Uh, what did it mean to have a space like this? What does it mean to have a space like East Point in the East Side? Um, and what drew you to want to open up your own business uh, at, that, at that place? Yeah, I mean, in short, it, mean, it means everything. Um, and when you know, Sandino and Jonathan were, you know, working to uh, tenant, or actually even, even get um, subsidy uh, for the development to make it work from the city. Um, you know, that was a point where Northeast Renaissance really wanted to, to step in and help make, uh, make it happen um, because we recognized that, um, you know the challenges that were that they were uh, going through in order to uh, to get things going. Uh, we felt like you know maybe this, this was kind of like one of those one-time opportunities uh, to really fulfill what our actual mission was is is which is to be a catalyst for what ethical place-based community development and that's exactly what that project uh, what East Point represents right and so um, the model itself um, is something that we were very interested in, in um, helping to incubate and see replicate, I mean, see successful and, um, you know, become replicable. And so um, we, we, we definitely wanted to, we also vouched for ourselves um, in order to, to help ensure that, you know, that it could happen. And then we wanted to further invest to help make sure that it would be a success. And so that's, that's kind of, um, and be a part of it, right? And so that's kind of how, um, you know, I, I became involved. Um, there have been businesses that were that fell victim to some of the same circumstances that that John and Sandino described. Uh, one in particular was Urban Roots, 
which was the last black owned um, space, uh, most similar hours in Deep Deuce. And so what we saw uh, happen to them is what essentially happened, happens in the plaza, what, uh, what happened in the plaza, what, the way John described, um, once um, a new standard was set, you know, the, the rent was increased to the extent that the business could no longer sustain, sustainably stay open. And so um, as a frequent, <laughs> frequent flyer there, um, you know, I really wanted to seize the opportunity in East Point um, and collaborate with uh, the folks that, that had the vision there and, and contribute to it. Um, and so our space, Kendrick Spirits, is, is uh, not only meant to be a contributor, but a kind of a gathering space and a, um, a helpful building block for you know, future community development. So we not only look at ourselves as a, as a watering hole, but the convener of, of like minds to, to help build the, the future of uh, not only 23rd Street, but um, other corridors in Northeast Oklahoma City. That's incredible. You know, talking about entrepreneurship and you, you made mention uh, specifically black entrepreneurship, uh, Sandina, I'll throw this to you and, and Quentin, feel free to, to jump in, but what does business ownership and entrepreneurship mean in communities like Northeast Oklahoma City? And what skills have you all been able to cultivate through partnerships with Dotson and, you know, setting up your own business, um, et cetera? Yeah, so I th so I think it means a lot. I mean, first of all, in the in the macro sense, like I mean, the majority of businesses, the majority of employment, like in the state, in the city, and in the country, is is really driven by small businesses, right? Um, and when you think about wealth building opportunities, when you think about um, the opportunities to sort of chart a path for some self determination, uh, right, and for us in our communities to decide what happens and to have influence over what happens. Um, then, I mean, own, owning the means, right? So be it, so, so be it, so having ownership, um, having, uh, businesses and having that, that type of influence is critical. Um, but as, as Dodds has mentioned and, and, and as Quentin has mentioned also, um, you know, the, the deck is not always sort of equal. Um, and so when you start talking about, uh, setting up businesses and creating opportunity, uh, I think you really have two dynamics that, that a lot of, uh, a lot of us will struggle with. I, I mean, I would say myself included. Um, one is access to capital, and then one is access to insight. And what happens is uh, it's not always obvious because it's really a matter of sort of these passive strategies or these systemic barriers that are set in place. So it's not someone actively saying we won't do this or we can't do this. It's just the fact that banks don't lend money over there. So, you know, we might have one or two banks, maybe a few credit unions in the community, and we're expect and they're expected to sort of carry the lion's share of the needs and their capacities are limited. Whereas you go into other geographic areas where you don't have that those systemic challenges, it's just the way things have been or the way things um, have sort of evolved because of, of, of prejudice or preferences or, assump or bad assumptions. In these other communities, I mean, you have just natural relationships with several bankers, with several opportunities with um, you know, with, with, with sort of quote unquote rich uncles or aunts, you know, and those kind of things. So when you're in these, so when you're in communities where you don't have some of those backstops, um, something like a rent increase, uh, something like a license you didn't know about or a tax thing you didn't understand can wipe businesses out. And so that's why I, I, and I use that example just to say that both access to capital, where it's like, I mean, you know, a majority of businesses will fail in their first year. Uh, in the first two years. So, but, but a lot of that is premised on learning from the missteps, learning from the failures uh, to be able to persist and businesses often that make it are able to weather that storm. So in our, so a lot of the challenges we see are that, you know, between access to capital and insight to avoid some of the pitfalls um, and capital to help you ride through some of the pitfalls. Um, it just becomes uh, immensely difficult to have success when you know that generally, you know, businesses uh, to be successful have to go through sort of a couple of different steps. Um, so, I, so I think our experience um, in regards to how that translates to Northeast Oklahoma City community and the work that we're trying to do on 23rd Street, uh, to, to uh, Quentin's point is creating some space where um, hopefully people don't have to learn as many lessons because they know 
they can see and they can actually get to places where other folks have gone through some of those things. Um, so having gathering points and gathering places and having kind of East, East Point as an example with several different tenants, uh, there's not one tenant uh, at East Point who's not willing to share what they've learned, uh, willing to share insights and things like that. And I think that's almost as critical, whether it's saying, oh, well, you guys are struggling with finding financing. Did you talk to this banker? You know, we, cr we created this relationship with such and such. Uh, maybe we can make a phone call and make a connection, or we know that we have a couple of organizations who are looking to support uh, businesses or looking to support individuals in entrepreneurship here. So being able to make those kind of connections, I think, is critical because we have these systemic factors that that, that stack the deck, whether people want to accept it or not. I mean, there are, there are passive as much as active factors that make it difficult uh, for any business to be successful. But then when you look at having sort of one hand tied behind you between redlining, between historic underinvestment and disinvestment and disenfranchisement, um, those, to me, those things become critical. Quentin, do you have anything to add to that? Um. I'm, I'm trying to remember what the original question was. I kind of, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but what I thought, what I think is, um, is pretty, is kind of awesome is um, what Sandino uh, referenced about, you know, the the ownership group at East Point um, kind of forming its own um, ecosystem and support, uh, you know, support group uh, to help each other out. And um, that's kind of some of that uh, missing, um, that's something that's, that's maybe understated, you know what I mean, in terms of insight. And, you know, the, the, first, the first tenant at East Point that went out and took, and took a leap was uh, Intentional Fitness. And, um, you know, just to support him, you know, I joined and when I go work out, we talk every day about business and about, um, you know, different resources and opportunity. And as, you know, as the pandemic, um, response and you know financial assistance came about. We we each consistently um, you know tried to support each other, refer each other. Um, you know we stood together in requesting support from the city. Um, and so that you know if you think about it, I wasn't really thinking about it until he mentioned it. Um, that's that's really a beautiful thing. Um, but you know just us all making that investment and taking that risk, it kind of put us all in the same boat. Uh, to be quick, kind of crossing those sands if I made together, um, and, and you know, and as a result, we're we're just more than um, you know, we're more than willing to to help each other, and um, you know, more more situations like that are going to need to exist, um, you know, and even at an advanced level, um, as we kind of continue, uh, and and hopefully we'll be in, a, I'm sure we'll be in a position to, uh, as Sandino said. Uh, help help our future business owners avoid 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 some of those pitfalls and really uh, really kind of stand on our shoulders. Well, yeah, I, and I, one 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 thing I, I just wanted to add to what Quentin said real quickly, uh, Mariana, is just the so one of the things I think that that we have also learned at, out of that right and and what and what's important, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship and, and small businesses being developed. The proof of concept of seeing these things. So um, I want to be. I want to set the record straight that there are um, other um, uh, retail. There are other operators and 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 small business even hubs and things like that. You know, on 36 and in different parts of, of the northeast side. So uh, I don't want to. I don't want to at, at all make it seem like you know we 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 were the only thing present. In fact, and to some extent. Um, working with some of the folks who had even been uh, operating businesses for, for decades um, on 23rd Street was important. Um, and I bring that up because I think one of the things that East Point did, even for some of the existing businesses, was it created a, a little bit larger uh, center of gravity, if you will, because we had all of these, we had all these activities and services sort of in a place and really sort of make it a push for people to pull in the same direction. So what what we've seen just in the few, just in the year that we've had like several of the businesses open is other entrepreneurs and other folks who are interested 
seeing now having a reference point and able to see and project sort of how things could manifest. So where we had 40 LOIs that Jonathan mentioned uh, that we kind of went through to figure out who would be the right kind of tenants. Well, what we've learned actually is what it takes to have different, a different mix, both um, income level experience wise and those kind of things. And you've started to see now uh, tenants say, well, what's next or where are there additional opportunities or uh, what do you guys think about the opportunity that I'm trying to pursue with my family or somebody who owns property adjacent to what's happening? And all of those things are beautiful uh, for us when you think about like this project being catalytic to create more opportunities. And I think that also is just worth mentioning um, as far as the, the opportunities for other entrepreneurship is really that that center of gravity and creating a large enough center of gravity where you can, where, where more things can start to happen around it. No, that's a great point. Thank you so much for, for adding that. And I think that that's a great segue. You know, Jonathan, as a community supporter and partner, and obviously the, you know, being a co-owner, um, how do you, you talked about representative businesses, you know, Q and Sandino talked about how the kind of authentic uh, community building and the ecosystem building that has taken place at East Point how do you ensure uh, or support um, that those businesses, those tenants remain resilient throughout these times, you know, as we're talking about the pandemic that Quentin had mentioned and so many other sort of things that are happening, um, constraints uh, that are being placed on small businesses at this time? Yeah, I think to back up for a second, I think one of the things that just to, to mention, um, the hard part of going in and developing and meeting people that um, trust you and are on the same team is what one of the key issues is if you develop at east side of Oklahoma City or west side of Oklahoma City, your costs are the exact same. Um, so your costs don't change at all. But what does change is what people are used to paying in rent. And so Sandino or Q could have gone to a number of buildings in Oklahoma, on the east side of Oklahoma City and probably paid I don't know, half of what they pay um, for even a, a building that, you know, I think we have our rents are about 25 to 30% below what's market rent on the west side of town. Um, and really, we pushed the rents down as low as we could to generate enough of a return to get somebody some, some money, an investor their money back at some point down the road. And so it wasn't even really a financially what you would call like financially driven model. And so for us, what became important uh, for Sandino and I and Pivot was actually creating enough upside for people. So, if, you know, Q is going to go in and pay a little bit more in rent than what he would really prefer to do. Um, it can't just be because he likes Sandino and me. There's got to be something else there. And so that's where um, equity becomes something. He knows that the value that he's going to create in Kindred um, is something that he's going to get to see the upside in. And so that's super uh, important and powerful. And so when you talk about building resiliency, um, you know, the, the, the traditional model of landlord tenant is if something's broke, we fight over who's going to fix it. And so the, you know, the question is always, well, I, that's, you know, read the lease, it's your fault. And, you know, then you sue each other, whatever. But when your partner is together, it changes the discussion. It changes the discussion on rent escalations. It changes the discussion on how to fix something. Um, you become partners in the long term, And so what that also means is when things get tough, like they did in COVID, where we had some tenants who paid, some tenants we, you know, they were like, I can't do anything, you know, you have a gym and or a restaurant and uh, no one's able to come out to eat. It's like, you got to figure out something, right? And so the goal becomes then how do we, how do we do this together? Because we're all, we don't want to lose the real estate. None of us do. We're all like, we're all going to, to, uh, receive a benefit from from being able to find a way to make this thing work through and so that means as pivots role it's to negotiate as best as we can with banks to get savings so we can pass those on to the tenants so that the tenants then you know can have some relief and so uh, i think it's really restructuring the tenant landlord relationship that hopefully helps i mean at some point though like kindred has to be awesome and it is right so like it, it kindred not been good at all there would have a chance there would have been a point of like okay do we rebrand and do something else there or do we go find a new tenant and um that would have been a discussion we all would have had right but um the idea if you're good 
and we have a partnership, it does create a, um, an environment where you can be sustainable and push through um, difficulty. That's a great insight. You know, you talked about, well, all of you all have, have talked about kind of resources that have been leveraged, you know, from concept to development to now operation. Uh, could all of you, all three of you talked about any financial or non-financial resources that you all have been able to leverage? We talked about sort of the city's involvement, um, both on the development side and then on the operation side with some of their small business uh, economic relief programs. Um, any other financial or non-financial resources that you would uplift during this conversation or diving in deeper into even those resources and how you were able to navigate and obtain some of those resources. Sandina, I see you smirking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. I, I gotta. I'm gonna go first before Dr. Hughes tries to slide in. Um, so uh, yes, I would say that. Um, so we actually have let we we pretty much leveraged uh, every resource that we get our hands on. And I'm gonna say something that will be uh, maybe not controversial, but I mean it may be it, it'll be intriguing, right? So um, and, and I know Jonathan and Quentin have also thought about it a lot. So we have, uh, you know, Oklahoma City, I think famously was, you know, created in 1889. Um, the state of Oklahoma became, uh, became a state from a territory in 1907. Um, so one of the first laws that the state of Oklahoma passed were essentially Jim Crow uh, sort of black code laws, right? It, it, I think it's actually Senate Bill 1 um, on, on the record books. So we have um, 100 plus years of on the record sort of setting the tables uh, of discrimination. Um, when you look at the bonds, uh, the bond issues and how that has traditionally, uh, bond issues, sales taxes, things like that, how they traditionally have been um, sort of proffered, promulgated, and then passed uh, in the community in the city of Oklahoma City. And I'm talking about over 50 or 60 years or whatever the case may be. Um, you had these uh, both explicit and sometimes just implicit prejudices about what could happen. Um, when you look at zoning uh, laws and regulations, so you will notice on the Northeast side, um, so uh, a good portion of Oklahoma City used to be um, oil field, right? Well, what you'll notice on the Northeast side up to this day are active oil wells dispersed in the middle of uh, residential communities, right? Um, where you have kids playing um, and, and, and walking home from school and things like that. So you have these markers and reminders of both the explicit uh, uh, sort of uh, inequalities and then these implicit inequalities, which are just per which persist themselves when you have those kind of things set in place. So my point with all of that is um, we feel pretty strongly not that we have expectations of the city or of the state or even of federal uh, or community partners and philanthropic organizations needing to give us anything uh, to be successful, but we absolutely feel like if you take all those things sort of as a whole, all those challenges, uh, you look at the housing crisis, you know, and, and the color of law sort of, sort of view on the housing crisis and the GI Bill and all of those kind of inequities, right? It took hundreds of years of, I mean, hundreds of years of inequities we have on the books. We won't fix that just because maybe the last 20 or 30 years, we've had a change in sentiment and, uh, and frankly, more support from the city. We have a mayor who has expressed his commitment to both diversity and supporting these kind of initiatives. Uh, we have a, a lot of relationships from the state uh, to the city council, to, uh, to local community leaders and philanthropic organizations trying to support those things. But, uh, you know, 10 years or 20 years of trying to sort of set that course right won't just make these things fix overnight. So what I will say is that we do believe that the same kind of systemic disinvestment that happened for decades and decades, um, we need to see some sort of uh, systemic investment happening, right? And so we uh, make those pushes and try and make them in an equitable fashion. 
um, and an equitable approach, but really think it's important to be able to say to the community and have honest conversations that in order to address some of these challenges that we're facing and have these projects be successful, we're going to need things like economic assistance during a pandemic. So we took advantage of those things. Some of our businesses would not have survived without the efforts of uh, the Urban Renewal Authority um, and the city council and, and, and even the state um, pushing uh, opportunities for minority owned businesses and small businesses. We wouldn't be here, right? You can't, op you can't operate a gym you know, during a pandemic without those kind of supports, for example. Um, so I wanna make that point pretty explicit that I think those things are necessary, not because we want giveaways, but because we're trying to uh, tackle head on um, in an inclusive manner, which, which inclusive means sustainability uh, and profit margins are harder to find because you're not being driven by the highest cost um, that you can extract out of every piece of development or business that you operate. And so we need those kinds of supports. Um, as we move forward, if we want to see some of those things undone, I don't think it'll take a hundred years, but it won't be five or six years of sort of concerted effort either, right? It'll take uh, somewhere in between that, I really think, to find a balance in, in, in dealing with those inequities. Yeah, and I would say um, to that point, uh, we at, at Kendrick, we did uh, benefit from pretty much uh, most of the list that Sandino mentioned, uh, especially the city of Oklahoma City, Okira, um, those programs, um, and also uh, kind of due to some of that, uh, you know, some some of those kind of systems that are in place, uh, even even our business with with ownership that we feel like was pretty uh, knowledgeable um, about you know, systems like that and navigating um, and applying for these types of, uh, these types of programs, uh, we still missed out on uh, quite a bit of opportunity um, because we either just didn't have those insights that Sandino, that Sandino mentioned, or we weren't quick enough on the draw because we didn't understand, um, you know, that, um, that 12 o'clock uh, a.m. really meant 10, 10 p.m. that day, <laughs> the day before, you know, and having, um, having set up, you know, an accountant um, that has, it, you know, kind of inside tracks and things of that nature. So um, I feel like our business was um, was definitely able to leverage, you know, what we brought to the table. But there are so many uh, businesses on the east side that weren't able to do that uh, in the same way um, because they just didn't have the same the same capacity. So let's just say, you know, about 50 50 percent of the time. Uh, we were able to make something happen. You know, I'd say um, a quarter of that, maybe even 10% of the time, our, you know, our counterparts on the east side were able to, uh, to benefit in the same way. Because um, those systems require uh, cert you, you know, cert certain technical or, or certain qualifications um, that you have to have in place. Uh, is, you know, your, your banking, your, your accounting, your bookkeeping, um, you know, your timing. Uh, your ability to articulate, you know, all of these things are required because that system was built, you know, based on, you know, a certain demographic being able to, to produce those um, because that same demographic created the list of, of, uh, of qualifications, right, of requirements. And so uh, with, with, so with 100 years of, um, you know, suppression and not having that same type of uh, background and insights, um, you know, all of a sudden, all of these these opportunities pop up, and, and there's a, a, a demand for you to move. Like yesterday, um, it really put a whole lot of businesses uh, in jeopardy. And so, uh, yes, we benefited uh, quite a bit, not as much as maybe we we would the next we will the next time, <laughs> based on what we know. Um, and we, we're definitely probably. Um, unfortunately, like head and shoulders above, you know, everybody, uh, many of the other business in terms of preparedness. You know, I, I'm, I'm, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead. Jimmy. I was going to say quick, quickly from a developer side. I mean, you know, really what we did was we accessed TIF. We, you know, we're in an opportunity zone. There's potential for new market tax credits, but the, again, the whole system is is uh, to Q's point 
has a language um, and a reference point that doesn't really tend to focus where we were trying to develop, which is on the east side of town. And so, you know, we took our tip and instead of using it to mitigate risk, uh, we, we used it to pass on to the tenants to help build up their space. So our tenants got six times the amount of TI that we would give on the, or tenant allowance, which is dollars to help build out their space, six times the amount that we, than we would give to um, the, you know, our tenants on the west side of town. And, and I think um, we asked, well, there's a lot of money, a lot of TIF came in and, and the Alliance was critical in making that happen. I mean, I think 27% of our project cost is coming in the form of a TIF, which is from a percentage standpoint, uh, really high. And um, there was a lot of backlash on that because people just felt like we were trying to, you know, make a lot of money for ourselves. And I think uh, to Sandino's point, there's really no way to, um, people say, well, what's market rate? If, if you've destroyed a market for a hundred years, you can't just start and pretend like the market is now fair. And I've used the example of Sandino and I had to fight each other, but I kept him from eating any food for 40 days. I'd have a pretty good chance at beating them up uh, if we got in the ring, uh, even if it's a fair fight, uh, because I starved them for 40 days. And so we financially starved the community for, you know, a long time. And then just to say, well, the market is now a free market. It's not free. Um, and so you have to have that kind of investment into those uh, areas over and over and over and over again. And so the next project that we do it probably won't be 27%, but it will be significantly higher than anything we would ask anywhere else because we have to have that to make the numbers work. Well, and I appreciate each of you, you know, talking about capital and not only capital in the form of financial capital, but social capital and making sure as we are designing programs and investment that we consider both social and financial capital in the alignment with community capacity um, and making sure that we really are addressing some of those inequities. You know, we've talked about where we were and where we are today. I wanna pivot, uh, I said that on purpose, um, to where we're going. Uh, so I want, we have about 10 minutes left. You know, you all talked about a, a renaissance that's happening, some of the catalyst projects that are going on, including your own, which, from me to you all, congratulations on the 2021 uh, Urban Land Institute Global Award. That's huge for, for not only Northeast Oklahoma City, but the city, the state, um, and the country, in our country. So just hats off to you all on that. But where are we going so far as Northeast Oklahoma City and Renaissance? This is the first of hopefully many projects. MAPS 4 is coming down the pipeline. Uh, could you all take just a few minutes to, to talk about what's the future for Northeast Oklahoma City and the city as a whole? And I'll start with right. Sandino. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was gonna say since I got introduced last, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut in line. So um, yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll try and be brief because I, I I think that um, what's next for us. I mean, so this this development um, has had some success um, and it actually has probably had more notoriety than we anticipated. So that is a good thing for sure, but it has the potential to be a challenge for us. So I think uh, what's next for us is to really think about um, the positives, the lessons that we've learned, and, and, to and to take this next step on how do we create um, opportunity for these entrepreneurs and other small business owners and, and interested parties who are starting to say, okay, well, um, we're seeing what happened. Like, how do we, how do we participate? I've got an idea. What's the next thing? And so uh, really trying to organize, I think, just in this context, um, 23rd, uh, Northeast 23rd is a corridor. Uh, there's a lot of support. Uh, we have worked with um, the East End uh, Merchant Association to get the merchants, especially those who've been there for years, uh, organized. Um, the city is definitely uh, bringing to the table some capital improvements um, and some capital infrastructure uh, dollars. And then we know that MAPS 4 will um, bring a couple of different projects, one to improve transportation and then another and, and then several projects around the uh, Freedom Center and, uh, and some of those uh, physical infrastructure assets. So the challenge for us is the notoriety and I think the success that we've had in the short term um, has created uh, a lot of forces for uh, negative, negative uh, gentrification and for displacement of what exists. And so we really want to sort of step up the efforts on how we can encourage uh, development uh, in the surrounding uh, 
uh, areas to East Point and how we can really sort of see uh, more um, local uh, community members to participate in what's happening um, so that they can so we can sort of preserve uh, people getting priced out of the community because of some of these positive uh, developments. Yeah, I guess. Uh, Whitney, you want yeah, to hop in? Yeah, I'll add to that. And so um, one of our, our strategies for that is, you know, addressing that access to capital issue, right? So leveraging, you know, the experiences and insights we've gained, we've gained from partners like Pivot. Um, and also my, my current employer, we're going to look to become the bank so that we can be a part of investing in ourselves. And so, um, you know, part of what we're looking to do is establish our own uh, funds that, that focus on uh, community and economic development. So uh, that, that will include real estate, commercial, and even uh, small business uh, development, um, leveraging, as we mentioned, not only the insights from, from Pivot, but also insights from those tenants from East Point um, and, and, their, and their own visions um, and now opportunities to build on what, what they've had to struggle to create. And so, you know, with those projects that Sandino mentioned coming online, um, there's, there's going to even, there's going to be continuing interest, in, but also speculation. Um, so we'll leverage those resources to kind of get, um, you know, slow some of that down and um, build in and embed opportunities for the the community itself and their stakeholders to, to benefit and uh, create or generate wealth uh, from future opportunities, uh, just as the, the model that was built at, at East Point. Thank you. And, and Jonathan? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think there's a, you know, a couple of things for in terms of, I think there's like the, what is the gravitational pull of, and I think that's what Sandino was talking to, if, if there's no fight, and we just allow gravity to do its work, what, what will happen? And I think that's a reality that none of us want. Um, the, the, you know, if we're, if we're fight, if we're able to put up a good fight, what does that look like? And so, you know, I think part of it is that there's a huge housing issue on the east side of town. And, you know, I wish that um, Kaylee would have been able to come on because I think she could have talked about kind of what Restore OKC is trying to do from a housing standpoint. The Alliance has been actively engaged in trying to figure out how to help with some of that. But it's really, um, if middle class wealth, if 80% of middle class wealth is derived by home ownership, uh, equity in their home, and we've, you know, to what uh, Sandino said, withheld uh, any kind of traditional uh, financing for home, single home buyers, single family home buyers on the east side uh, due to the color of their skin. Um, you've really prevented a whole subset or you've made it more difficult for a whole subset of folks to exist that exist, uh, you know, that have my color, right? And so you've taken away 80% of, of uh, middle-class wealth by doing that. And so we can't fix that overnight. But what happens is, is when downtown core gets gentrified and uh, people are looking for like the next cheap place to go that's close to the city, um, East side is where, you know, is, is everyone has been fearful of that, that that's where they'll end up going. Right. And so there, there has to be folks who have good intentions, who are wanting to preserve um, the, the ethos and feel of the East side and, and get ahead of that. And so I think, you know, that's what restore is trying to do. Um, I, I have a feeling that probably Sandino and Q are trying to do that as well. Um, and, and so one is to get ahead of it from that. The other is the retail side. And so um, as housing starts to happen and as more retail starts to happen, um, it just attracts developers who tend to not have maybe the same motivation. And so uh, the, in some ways it feels selfish, but the more that Q can do and Sandino can do and Monarch can do and a lot of these other folks who are really care about the community, um, the faster they can get ahead of this, the better off I think the community is as a whole. Um, I had someone who walked up to me the other day and slapped me on the back. I didn't know who it was. And they said, man, I heard what that you did East Point. And I just wanted you to know, thanks so much. And I you know, thought he was going to say thanks for the equitable nature of our development or whatever. And he said, I just flipped a home there and made like 30%. And like, 
my insides just died, right? Because that's what we don't want to have happen. That's the stuff we're trying to fight. And so um, I think there is a sense of how do we how do we try to get ahead of this as quickly as we can? Because if not, um, we're going to lose out in the long run. Yeah. So anybody who's uh, who's watching out there, um, you know, and interested in uh, being a kind of a part of of this movement um, in an equitable way, uh, you know, we're gonna we want folks that are <laughs> that are down to um, kind of kind of take on um, some of the characteristics of of a, a lot of what we call placekeepers. Um, that are that are here on our side of town that are looking to uh, they're definitely looking to be a part of getting uh, families to live in in northeast Oklahoma City, but do it in a way um, you know rehabbing homes in a way that is that is ethical. Um, and also, you know, if you're if you're in northeast Oklahoma City, you're a stakeholder, um, and you kind of want to be a part of that effort. Uh, you know, try to find a way to uh, connect with us, or at least connect with with that program. Uh, so that, you know, you can kind of prevent <laughs> or kind of get out in front of, you know, speculators like the guy who uh, smacked Jonathan on the back. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you're from here and you want to be a part of something, you know, uh, hop on our website, look on the placekeepers, uh, you know, program, um, apply for it. You can be trained and learn how to do this stuff um, and, and help kind of rebuild homes uh, for, for families. Um, and obviously there, there are some profits in it, but, you know, we're not looking for 30% because we're looking, um, to make homes afford, uh, to sell homes affordable enough uh, for families in our community to become home homeowners. Well, and, and Q, thank you for sharing that. I, if you all don't mind, I'm going to make sure that I share you all's not personal contact information, but websites. Uh, social media so folks can stay engaged around this discussion. I, and I love, again, the relationship between not only business ownership, but home ownership and assets, uh, attaining assets more generally um, as we talk about resiliency and cultural preservation and perseverance. So thank you three for, for joining me today. Again, congratulations on uh, everything that you all are doing uh, and will continue to do for the community and the betterment of Northeast Oklahoma City and the city as a whole. Uh, please stay engaged with us. Uh, again, I'm Mariana Adams with Progress OKC. Uh, we are a community development corporation and I am so grateful to be able to work alongside many of you all tackling some of these issues and addressing these opportunities. And with that, we will conclude. Thank you all, have a great afternoon. I will share their contact information on our website and our social media. Stay engaged, get involved, um, and have a good week. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Mariana. Thanks for the invitation. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye.